Hi everyone, in this video our objective is to address Old Regents questions related to heating and cooling curves. So let's first remember what one of these things looks like. Here we have a typical heating curve. What it's showing you is as time progresses and heat is added to a substance at a constant pace, the substance will transition from a solid in this region and the particles will be absorbing the energy and be rearranged to become a liquid. They're all liquid at this point here. Then that liquid will be absorbing energy and increasing in temperature until it reaches this point here where it will begin to vaporize and the energy it is now absorbing is used to rearrange the particles to form a gas and at this point E it is all a gas. That substance is now all a gas and the energy being absorbed, the heat being absorbed, is used to increase the temperature of that gas. Now the opposite would also be true, and remember as it's going to the right, if it's increasing, the substance is absorbing energy, so this would be endothermic, and if it was the opposite going downward, and the substance were to be losing energy, it would be exothermic. So let's take a look at some questions. So here we have question one. Given the diagram rep representing a heating curve for a substance, and here is that heating curve, it's climbing, it's again an endothermic situation, the question reads, during which time interval is the average kinetic energy of the particles of the substance constant, while the potential energy of the particles is increasing? So average kinetic energy means temperature. That's its definition. Average kinetic energy means temperature. So, where is the temperature increasing? So again, which uh, time interval is the kinetic energy of the particles of the substance constant? Constant. So we're looking for a part on this diagram where the temperature is not increasing at all. So we've got right here, and we've also got right here. So we have sub, uh, segment BC and segment DE, and if the kinetic energy is not increasing, the potential energy must. So which one of these suggests that? And it is BC. Now here's question two. The graph below represents the uniform heating of a sample of a substance starting at solid below its melting point. A solid below its melting point. So here it's a solid. This would be its melting point. So it's just saying that it is beginning at A. And A is a solid and it's already much below its melting point. Here's the question. Which statement describes what happens to the energy of the particles of the sample during time interval DE? So from D to E, what is happening to the energy of the, uh, the substance, the sample. So is the average kinetic energy increasing? Well, I've already noted in the last question that when we have a plateau like this, the energy is not increasing. Well, the average kinetic energy, I should say, is not increasing because that relates to temperature. So it cannot be number one. And for that matter, um, actually I thought another choice would say average kinetic energy increasing, but scanning 2, 3, and 4, it isn't. So let's read this. Is the average kinetic energy decreasing? No, it's not decreasing. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of that. Is the average kinetic energy remaining the same? Yes. And if the average kinetic energy remaining the same, we have to be looking for um, a question that, or a choice that says that the potential energy is then increasing. And the remains of choice three says, and the potential energy increases. So right then and there, I have found my answer. For completeness, let's read four. Average kinetic energy remains the same, true, and the potential energy decreases, absolutely false. So the choice is three. So number three. 
Starting as a solid, a sample of a substance is heated at a constant rate. The graph below shows the changes in temperature of this sample. What is the melting point of the sample and the total time required to completely melt the sample after it has reached the melting point? So we are looking for the melting point to begin with and I know that it's a, the, um, the substance is a solid here and a liquid here. So it will be melting at this point right here and that is 50 degrees Celsius. Now, how much time does it take for it to melt? Well, it begins melting at 2 minutes and finishes at 5, which is a total of 5, I'm sorry, a total of 3 minutes. Scanning the answers, choice 1 says exactly that. Question 4. What is the total amount of heat absorbed by 100 grams of water when the temperature of the water is increased from 30 to 45 degrees Celsius? Now I do know that I have formulas I can use and those formulas are represented right here. I have heat formulas and one says Q is equal to MC delta T where Q is heat, M is mass, C is specific heat capacity of water and delta T is change in time. I have a formula that says, that says Q is equal to MHF again M is mass, HF is the heat of fusion, and Q is equal to MHV, and HV is heat of vaporization, and again, M is mass. So my first task is to decide which formula to use. Now, I do recall in this formula, or the question, it said something about a change in temperature. So I know right off the bat, I'm going to be using this formula right here. So, I have, let me grab a pen, Q is equal to MC delta T. So, let's start putting in some of the numbers we know. Q is equal to, the mass is 100 grams. Okay, um, the change in temperature, uh, well, 45 Point zero minus 30.0. I know that my temperature is changing 15 degrees. Okay, I'll put times. Let me also erase some of this, make some room. Okay. So times it was 15 degrees Celsius. And it doesn't matter the order that I place these. So uh, the next thing I need to find out is what is C? The value of C is. And for that, I could open up this reference table where it identifies for us the specific heat capacity of water is 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin. Now, let me show you how we can use this. So that was 4.18 joules per every gram Kelvin. Now I have to also recall that every single time um, a substance increases one degree Celsius, it also climbs one Kelvin and vice versa. So if we're just looking for the change in temperature, well, if you changed 15 degrees Celsius, that's also saying that you changed 15 Kelvin. So we could take that leap of faith. Now if we take a look at our units, if we have grams on the top, grams on the bottom, grams divided by grams would equal 1, and 1 impacts an equation. Well, it doesn't. If you multiply by 1, an equation remains the same. We've got Kelvin and Kelvin, and our last unit standing will be in joules. So at first we will go 15 times 100 is 1500 times 4.18. Now, I don't have a calculator on me, so let me just multiply it by 4 and see if it gets me to a point where I could uh, estimate. So 1500 times 4, 0, 0, 0, carry the 2, 4 times 8. Roughly 10,000. It's going to be a little bit more than that because there's 4.18 
and I was ignoring the 1A. And the choice that is slightly above 10,000 is choice 3. Now, if you don't believe me, take out your own calculator, multiply 4.18 times 1,500, see what you get. Let's move on to number 5. All right, here's number 5. It's a little bit involved, and I need to move fast because I see that I will run short on time. So if you need to, please pause, rewind, redo, whatever you need to to understand this one. Here we go. A 36 gram sample of water has an initial temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. So that's where it's beginning. After the sample absorbs 1,200 joules of heat energy, so it's absorbing energy, its temperature is going to climb. So its final temperature must be higher than 22 degrees Celsius. And it does want to know what the final temperature of this sample is. Now because I know that it changing temperature, I know that I must use the formula Q is equal to MC delta T. All right, so what do I know about this? I know Q is 1,200 1, joules. I know the mass is 36 grams. I know C is 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin. Now, because, as noted before, as Kelvin changes, Celsius changes, it could actually even be degrees Celsius. And we are trying to solve for delta T. All right, so what can we do to simplify this? Well, I could combine these two. And when I do that, I get 1,200 joules is equal to, and I did the math previously, 100 50.48 grams disappear and it would be joules per degree Celsius and then we would be time well our delta T times delta T so what do we do here well I would divide my right side by 150.48 joules degrees Celsius so I could divide this side by the same to isolate the delta T on the right side. Joules, degrees Celsius, our units cancel out. And I could tell you from the math I did previously, my delta T is equal to, where is it? 7.97 degrees Celsius. And as I said earlier, the temperature will climb. So it began as 22 degrees Celsius. It climbed roughly eight giving us a final temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. And lastly, here is number six. What is the minimum amount of heat required to completely melt 20 grams of ice at its melting point? So I do know that my temperature is not changing, so I'm not using the MC delta T. I do not see any evidence that a vapor is being formed or a uh, substance is being changed from a vapor to a liquid, so I'm not using the heat of vaporization formula. I will be using the M is equal, I'm sorry, the Q is equal to MHF. So let's do this. Q is equal to, I have a mass of 20.0 grams, and I know that HF, heat of fusion, is 334 times 330. 4 joules per gram. So if I multiply this, our grams cancel out, <clears throat> and 20 times 334, well, 10 times that would be 3340. So 20 times would be 2 of that. So I know that I am looking for 6680. And there's my answer, choice number 3.